Um, my presentation today is two part. One is uh, the data um, accelerator of a slalom, and then the non slalom part of me is going to talk about how to take uh, the accelerator that um, slalom has developed in a house to LM ops or large language model operationalization. So, um, um, the agenda I'm going to go through today is an overview of the accelerator, sure and then how this accelerator creates the value from a business point of view, and of course, how we can go from data ops to element ops, and I'll show you the linkage between uh, every single piece here. All right, speaking of the accelerator, so um, what happened? All right, I don't know I can just lay like that. Nick, I need your help. What happened here? All right. Very good. Square. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's still, um, this guy is just moving the thing up and down. Okay. I can drive it if you want. All right. As long as I have this laser beam thing. All right. Uh, so, um, so there, there are several uh, accelerators on Databricks website. If you just go and uh, search through the blocks, Slalom Data Accelerator is one of them. Um, and in the next slide, I'll show you just the snapshot of how uh, to get the more information on the accelerator. So the accelerator, all it is about is just to enable your data in the lake house, or in other words, to bring your data either on-prem or cloud, just to bring it to the lake house. And it has a couple of verticals, or a couple of components, if you like. The very first important piece is the infra. Then it goes to DevOpsing and then pipelines and curation um, layer or the machine learning layer. The infrastructure, so uh, by the way, the accelerator is nothing but a bunch of codes that you run them, either through some CI, CD, or you need to deploy those codes just to enable um, that platform for you and then you can mount your data to Lakehouse through that bunch of codes that we refer to as accelerator. So one of those codes are Terraform templates. For you to just go to Lakehouse, you need to ensure you have the services provision. To do that, you get use of Terraform templates. We already have them there for you. Just uh, It's a matter of clicking and enabling it on your platform, would that be Azure, GCP, or AWS. Then DevOps um, is there, meaning that you have the semantic of dev, test, and prod as well as there are some pipelines that test the data for you if you want to go to the test layer of a uh, platform. It tests things for you before it goes from dev to test to prod. Test the quality of the data, the pipelines, and all that. The third column is the pipelines. So um, there are, by pipelines, we are talking about ETL, extract, transfer, or load. And the good thing about those pipelines is that they are metadata driven which adds more value. Um, you can leverage data, you can consume some information about your tables and put them as a parameter in your pipelines. They're already there. And then you can use that accelerator when your data has gone through all those phases. It's ready for you to have machine learning models in there to take it to production. Um, now the benefit of this accelerator, um, the key benefit is timing. Like, this is the snapshot I told you about, Databricks Expands, Brick Builder Program. This is where you can read more about this accelerator. But the key value is time, and time is money, right? So if it would have taken you weeks or months to go to production grade data lake house with the accelerator and codes available there, they can get there in less than three weeks. However, just disclaimer, subject to architecture approval, but this is a rough estimate, right? Three weeks. And then if you have some sample data source, to onboard it to the platform that is there, it takes less than one hour. And this is where the real value lies, right? And now there are steps into that Lakehouse accelerator. The steps are typical for those of you who already know Databricks and the Medallion architecture. Um, everything is to start with the landing zone. So the landing zone is there just, this is the exact replica of all sources of your data. Then goes to raw zone, then goes to process zone, which we, Databricks refers to as a silver zone and then goes to the curated zone, which again through the Medallion architecture terminology is called the gold zone. So silver, gold, silver, gold, and there's a bronze before that. The raw zone here is a replica of your landing zone, except things are delta now. 
And the advantages now, you can leverage data works capabilities, delta table, time travel, and all that. So it's basically a replica of what you have in the lambda zone. And the next layer, the process zone is there, you do some processing in your data, which could be some filtration, which could be some PII removal of your data. And you store it in a process zone, again, in a delta format. Now, the purpose is just to have things stored in a process form in delta. Data scientists can start connecting to data here. However, my recommendation always is to connect your curated zone or gold zone, then everything is aggregated. And you can, of course, it's data rich, you can type things in SQL, you can code in Python or Scala. The purpose here is for BI developers. So you can, um, Nick just showed us how you can talk to Power BI directly inside Databricks, or you can connect it to another instance of Power BI in whatever cloud platform you have or Tableau. Data scientists can also connect to this layer. So these are different like um, the steps uh, in terms of flow of the data in the accelerator. Now, what are the components? So we know the value of the accelerator. We know the steps. You know uh, uh, now what it does. But what are the tools in there? So there are a bunch of tools in there that I'm going to show you in the next slide. The key components of the accelerator are um, basically an orchestrator. Um, and by the way, this is just the accelerator in Azure. We have the same accelerator in AWS. Azure Data Factory is just nothing but an, an orchestrator. It just does the ingestion, the copy activity, brings things into the lighthouse. And this is where the lighthouse layer is, the second key component. And Databricks is there just to get use of uh, everything data and AI. You can do your transformation. This set of tooling allows you to separate your ETL from your orchestration, and it adds more maintainability and handling in that sense if you kind of segregate these layers from one another. In Databricks, again, Databricks is a one roof type of thing, end to end. That's one of the key things Nick was showing to us in the last presentation. You can do both data engineering and data analytics in there. So these are the three key platform components of the accelerator. Um, and this is the reference architecture. So you start from a source system, then you take things as a batch load, to, um, like use of some uh, orchestrators, such as Azure Data Factory. If you have a streaming, you're going to get use of Azure Event Hub or Azure IoT Hub. However, it's not enabled in that accelerator, but it's very much feasible. And then you bring things into Lakehouse, sorry, to Data Lake Storage. And once you're there and you can go from there to Lakehouse, you can get use of every beautiful things that Databricks offers. Transformation, you can do governance through Unity Catalog, everything end to end. You can get use of the analytics tools such as Power BI, you can do some machine learning uh, by getting use of MLflow models in there, or you can do Delta sharing. These gray boxes are to just consume. And of course you have some security layer, that's the reference architecture. These are the services you leverage to enable security. And there is some CI, CD pipeline in there to kind of uh, industrialize your data. So this was the accelerator. How is it going to create value? It's just, if you look at the topper picture and compare it to the lower one, you're going to see the value, like why are they doing all of these data migration, data moving? Because we want some end users to use them. Those could be some visualization guys who could be machine learning people. So the value lies, uh, the, at least the top, top two categories of value lies in the BI use cases or data science use cases. If you spend all of your time on going through this journey of industrializing your data and bringing your data to Lakehouse, then you don't have much time for value creation. However, the accelerator allows you to ingest your data in a very faster fashion to get to the value creation. So you have more time for value creation piece, which are BI or data science use cases. All right, before I go now to the lineage between data ops and LM ops, I just wanted to touch base on a machine learning experiment life cycle. So everything on the accelerator, let's keep it there. We're gonna talk a little bit about the machine learning operationalization and then we'll see how the relationship and the lineage come. So usually then you are in the lakehouse, now you've brought all of your data into lakehouse, let's say you're in the curated layer. Data scientists have started doing some experimentation. So lakehouse is basically a consistent uh, single source of truth that data engineers and data scientists can operate. 
So you bring your data, you do training and testing, ML engineers, data scientists, uh, perform their analysis and experimentation there, and they log their models. Model one is decision tree, model two is random forest. You want to see which model works best on your data. I'm talking about machine learning models or data science models. And then you see which model is best. If this model is not the best one, you go back, you do the training again, you go through this loop iteratively, and then you deploy your model. So just to level set everyone here in the room, model deployment is nothing but just creating an API link out of the model. Uh, meaning that you want to run a model, you uh, like an executable. So that's model deployment. <coughs> meaning that I don't want to spend lots of time and CPU to go through this process. I have an API link, which I can ingest data into that API link, and that model, let's say it's a predictor, it predicts things for me. And that's the model deployment. And I'll, I'll see if that model performs well and my business value is attained or not. Otherwise, I'll go through this process until I feel that model is the best one to be. Now, from data ops to LLM ops. So first of all, what is data ops? So data ops is a practice. It has an objective from a technical point of view and an objective from a business point of view. So from business point of view, it's there to create value out of your data. Your data is not usable at the enterprise scale if it doesn't go through a process that's called data industrialization. From technical point of view is that come up with an architecture which is distributed and takes your data into some semantic granular level that gets you to the point that you can use that data at enterprise scale. So the data ops from technical point of view has key, some key features. First of all, it enables you to be collaborative. So data engineers, developers, managers, BI end users, they want to access the same data. They can share the data. They can share the pipelines that is behind the data. It's automated. When it's automated, that means there are some pipelines running them. Uh, and also, it makes it repeatable. And there is way less error when things are repeatable. And integration, so the CI, continuous integration. You can repeat the process through DevOps. So if I want to go through that accelerator we just showed you, and um, just formulate it in a data ops language, I'll simplify it to three layers, three semantic of dev test product. So everything needs to go through dev test prod. Now some companies have different preference. They say we want to have a pre-prod, we don't want to test, we want to U-add layer. These semantics are some isolation of processes. If you're, let's say, in Azure, these semantics could be resource groups. They could be same resource group, different instances of the services, or just could be different processes. Like I personally recommend different resource group for good isolation of the services and semantic of dev test prod. So you go to a lake, data lake, then you go to bronze, silver, gold, your delta here. Databricks pipeline behind the scene go through this process for you. You can enable ADF to do the orchestration for you, and this guy just do ETL. There is a DevOps pipeline, some YAML files that takes you from dev to test promote the code for you. So the only two key components in the data ops is data and code. However, whenever they go to MLOps, we have data, code, and model that you want to promote between dev test prod. So with the same token, data ops means data operationalization. ML ops is machine learning operationalization. So you industrialize your data. Now you can industrialize your ML model. Why would I want to do that? So it's important because of one key factor, which is productivity. With that, if you want to <clears throat> automate the processes, you need to go through ML ops. So I was reading some statistics, I think it was from Algorithmium, that up until 2021, most of the machine learning models that are developed at enterprise scale, 80% um, of them don't go to production. That means whatever you do on your Jupyter notebook is for yourself, it's just a prototype. If you want to use it in enterprise scale, that you can have an app, you can monitor it, you can see if the model is still going okay in the course of time, you need to go through ML ops. You need to industrialize, operationalize your machine learning model. This way, it's reliable. You can monitor your model. The model quality, you can compare quality of model A versus model B, and it's auditable. Now, the process is the same as that workflow I explained before. Business problem, there is a data foundation. You bring the data, you do a prototyping. You can be in Jupyter Notebook here. You prototype your model, you train your model. Now, you need to go to cloud. You compare model A versus model B versus model C. Like Databricks, MLflow can do that for us. It can track the model. You register the best model, you deploy it, you monitor that model to make sure 
that model is working okay. There are some index between zero and one to show the performance. And you just see if the business problem we defined in the beginning is now uh, addressed. Otherwise, you're gonna go through this process again and again. So this is MLOps. So we cover data ops, we cover MLOps. Now the question is how to go from data ops to MLOps. So there are two important things here. Again, that's my experience, that's my information um, give, just taken from the interaction with different clients and we have talked hours and hours with different clients to come up with this, that's my perspective. I think there are two key important things to go from data ops to MLOps. First thing, you're always gonna use your curated layer of data, then you want to feed your data from data ops to ML ops. So data ops is the left, ML ops is the right one. The other important thing to take into account is that whatever number of semantics you have, with whatever fashion, resource group, it could be different subscriptions in Azure or AWS, you need to honor the same for ML ops. So there is a one-to-one -one relationship between your dev in data ops and dev in ML ops. <coughs> test in data ops and test in MLOps. And um, same thing for prod. Now that we know this story, how to go from data ops to MLOps, let's go with one more granularity level here. So um, I'm going to just unlock uh, or unzip those uh, basically boxes you saw there in the previous slide, the test prod. This is just a more magnified version of them, what is happening inside each box. Um, like people have different opinions when they do MLOps. Some people want to do just um, training here, testing here, operationalization or deployment here. Databricks has two points of view. Um, they call it a code split MLOps or model split MLOps. Uh, Databricks suggests that whatever model training, registration, deployment, and inferencing, which I explained, you do in training, you should do it in production too. Why? Because there are offshore people here, there are different people um, with different level of access compared to production where managers have access or business owners. So you want to make sure that you do follow the same process here. The other thing is that the life cycle of model data and code could be different. So that looks like a simple sentence, but we can talk hours about it, why, what it means. Code, model, and data life cycle are different. And again, when you're talking about MLOps, all those three components needs to be integrated. But again, now I want to go from dev data ops to MLOps. So the story starts from here. My data is ingested in data lake. This guy is another instance of a data lake, but this is a test zone, so the test and prod could be a more enriched version of the first data layer, which is dev. The data in dev could be a subset of test or prod. So same processes that happen in dev happens in test or in prod. You go through bronze, silver, gold. The curated layer of the data is in gold. You take this data from gold and you take it to MLOps. So data goes from there all the way to gold, feed it to MLOps, then data goes to Data lake house, second layer test, goes to gold layer, feed it to the test, um, and then same thing in pro, one by one, one by one. Now some people say it takes lots of time. Yes, it does, but it adds value. But if you want to have a smaller business problem to address, you can define some sandbox for some business users there, which have the authentication to address the product, production zone, and do the same thing only here. There are two sub-layers inside dev, which are the CI and CD. CI is nothing but model training and registration. And CD is deployment, continuous deployment. You deploy your model, and then there is an API created. You start ingesting data in there. The model produces some prediction. You wait for the real data to come, and you do some model monitoring. So some metrics are generated between 0 and 1. 0.9, for instance, is a good number. If that number drops, like your model performance is kind of drifting or your data is drifting, you go back to the first step. So this is the MLOps in a more gory details. And now let's look at LLM ops, how to go from data ops to LLM ops. So everything that we did for machine learning remains the same for LLM. There are key, few key important differences between machine learning models and LLM. So when you're talking about machine learning models, let's say regression, my inputs are number. When I'm talking about a Gen AI or LLM, 
my inputs are just text, which you refer to them as prompt. So instead of having feature A, feature B, feature C as input to my model, I have prompts. So that's the first important difference. The second thing is that, all right, over there, MLflow or whatever other tool can tell me, okay, your model score, RMSE or root mean square error is 0.8. But when we talk about Gen AI, there isn't such a number. So there is only human in the loop that can say this model was a good one or not. There isn't like a number, a measurable metric to track the performance of LLM models. The second important thing. The third important things are GPUs. So you can run a regression model with one node of a CPU, all-purpose cluster of Databricks. But when it comes to NLM, remember there are a subcategory of NLPs, which they are a subcategory of deep learning. That means they need GPU, right? They need multiple cores to work together. Uh, and different layers of that models are passed to different cores to work simultaneously. So they're what GPUs offer. So that's another thing. And then you want to run things real time, meaning I'm chatting with a chatbot. I want a real time answer. So those GPUs need to be very fast. So three important key things here. So uh, the last thing, from a technical point of view, those machine learning models, I can train them. Meaning that, okay, give me 1,000 lines of data, numbers, as input. Give me 200 lines of data as test data. I have a trained test and all those classic data science concepts. But these models, like ChatGPT, which was one of the very first ones, they are already pre-trained for us. So I don't do any model training here. So these are the key differences. Everything else that I explained in the MLOps remain the same. Now let's see how we address those key differences in this architecture. For simplicity, I'm just um, showing this layer, prod to prod. So let's go prod to prod. I have a bunch of PDF or images over there, right? Or it could be some text file. I want to talk to a chatbot on the user here. And then that data could periodically change in that lake house. And I'm in the prod layer. So everything starts from here. The user asks a question from this bot here. This is the chatbot. The chatbot has gone through the same process of training, registration, deployment. Instead of training, we have tuning here, so you can tune your model. If it's a third-party model that Databricks doesn't like, and again, everything is Databricks here now, but you can apply almost the same concept to in the other platforms. If the model doesn't belong to Databricks, and instead of tuning that model, you're actually leveraging an API, you're tuning a pipeline that calls inside, um, that, that calls an API of an LLM model inside it. So instead of the model themselves, I have pipeline. So the model has gone here, got through here, and I'll explain how it got here. The user asks a question. First of all, that user question, bunch of text, goes through a large language model. Like in Azure, you have Ada, for instance, right? And it, it becomes embed, it's passed to here. Embedding is a bunch of vectors, type of numbers out of those prompts. And this guy is looking for answer. So he goes, tries to get knowledge from that data lake. But it has to go, to go through some processes. So that PDF was loaded in the bronze. There was something happening in the silver layer to extract the knowledge out of PDF. They could do some text chunking there. The data has gone to the gold layer. The data is delta format, which is the native format at Databricks. Now this guy is still looking for consulting to some database. The data get ingested here. It's better to go through some write processes. You're not gonna go through it. It gets embedded in, same thing as here. And it goes resides on a vector database. So six, seven months ago when I was like designing some general architecture, people were not interested to do vector database. But they became very important in the last couple of months, if you ask me, because of the value they offer. So you put those text or vectors that are now converted to numbers into a vector database. This guy does a similarity search with the question he got here. It retrieves the information, pass it to the user. Now, how do I do the monitoring? So if the user was happy with the response, he put a thumbs up. If it, he was unhappy, thumbs down. Those responses are captured in Unity Catalog through human feedback table. 
And then how do I make sure I have a record of the comfort, uh, conversation? It goes through a table that's called inference table. These two tables, I can find a way to ingest them to the vector database that next time, if this guy shows up, he has an idea uh, that uh, he has like uh, some conversation in the past. Now, the good news Databricks gave us, like in the Data and AI Summit, was that for you to make sure you're talking to the synchronous source of data, let's say a PDF came, some image came, some text was in there, and I updated that PDF, this guy doesn't have a knowledge of it, so in the past, in whatever platform, and I say past, I'm talking about six months ago, there had to be a pipeline, could be a Databricks job, that periodically batch those, load batch those data in. Now with the vector search, that thing just happens on the go. So vector search is there to just index things synchronously. So these are the list of services that technologies that Databricks has to get used in terms of models. So these are the native models, Mosaic ML, and Dolly in the very beginning are kind of having the best chemistry. These are the third party models, Google, Amazon, Azure. And previously they were just APIs, now we can import them as libraries. The vector databases that shows uh, best lineage or <coughs> chemistry and integration with Databricks are Chrome and Pinecone. And the chain orchestrator, you need a chain orchestrator. So if I wanted to do it in Azure with no Databricks, I would have combined cognitive services with Azure OpenAI and use Azure function to do the orchestration. LangChain also shows a good integration with OpenAI but, and also a good integration with Databricks. With that, I'd like to go to the very last slide just to talk about the latest advancement in large language models. So Nick bit me into that, like actually my knowledge is outdated, just Nick just showed a bunch of things that you know about the recent LLM <coughs> advancements. So vector search is what I, what I talked about. It does the indexing for you, and more, more, most importantly, it's automatically ingest and index new information for you, so you don't have to run the pipelines over and over, save lots of time and budget. GPUs, remember those GPUs, they need to inference things in real time. The new set of GPUs Databricks offers, not only they're secure, but they have low latency. It's very important. And the lake house monitoring is uh, just a monitoring layer that monitors both data and AI piece. Remember that thumbs up, thumbs down that the users just offers at the end of each interaction with the chatbot. It just is one of the things that lake house monitoring can monitor for you. And they have Lake House IQ. I haven't tested it myself, but I've seen the demos. It's basically nothing but just an engine um, that is AI powered. It goes on top of Unity catalog, and you can just converse with this guy, and it guides you through how to write your code. I think, Nick, you presented partly, I don't know, you named it something else, but I know this as Lake House IQ. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be